other questions, then we're going to go ahead and get started on 6.2. So you can still go back into the same uh, notes that we were working on last time. Okay, I'm going to pull that up on my screen and I see a few folks already in the document. But again, there's a lot of diagrams that I think are really hard to draw by hand. So it might be helpful for you if you can sort of um, pull that up for yourself or go ahead and print that out later uh, at some point later. Okay. All right. So we're going to go ahead and jump back into 6.2 and see where that takes us. That's not you guys. Okay. All right. So last time we talked about known cross sections and just to kind of remind us of where we were. We were looking at very specific shapes where we had some sort of base and then we had these slices coming out of the base that were all the same kind of shape, but just different sizes. So we had like semicircles and quarter circles and rectangles, triangles of different types, and then each one had a different area formula. And it was important for us to know the area formulas because we know that volume equals the integral of area. So in order to think about area, we needed to know these area formulas. So in question number one, it was a square. So we did length times width, but we also knew that the length and the width were exactly the same because it was a square. And then in example two, we, the, we, the shape got changed to a right isosceles triangle. So we couldn't use length times width, but we needed to use one half base times height. And then we took a look at number three, which again is a really um, probably common kind of question you should expect when you get back to ellipses in Calc 2, all right? Asking you to find the volume of these. And in example three, the volume um, slices were made up of rectangles. So we could use length times width, or we called it base times height, okay? And then question number five, um, which was our exit ticket from Tuesday, all right? Um, and that one, we our slices were semicircles, and so we needed to use the equation one half pi r squared. And so we were able to make these decisions because we knew what the slice was, and we had to figure out the area formulas. And then once we had the area formulas, we integrated them to find the volume, or we added them all up to find the volume, okay? So that's a quick summary of where we were last time. And at the very end, I was like, hey, I just wanna talk a little bit about um, our next piece for today and um, kind of get us thinking about it, okay? So again, the question for this next part is what happens when we don't have like triangles or semicircles or quarter circles, but everything is a circle? Okay, and so one thing I want us to note is that if everything is a circle, then the area formula we want to use is going to be pi r squared. Okay, so I could take a look at this right hand most picture and I could say that the area of that is going to be pi r squared. Okay. Um, but I'm wondering if you can take a moment to kind of think about this middle picture right here. So the difference here is that the middle picture has a hole in the middle and the right picture does not. So I'm wondering how we would go about finding the area of just the dark gray part. So not the little hole in the middle, but just the dark gray part. So what ideas do you folks have this lovely Thursday morning. 
subtract out the center circle from the whole circle? Yeah, exactly. Um, so I don't know how many of you actually have an air fryer or if you've tried that donut recipe, but um, the donut recipe at, that I showed you guys at the end of class last time says that you can just take like the Pillsbury dough and cut a hole in the middle. And so literally with a knife, you like cut out the middle piece and then you can actually make yourself a little donut hole afterwards. But that's exactly what we're doing here. If I want to find the area of the gray part, I would say pi big R squared, because that's the larger radius, like the radius of the entire circle. And then we have to subtract pi little r squared, or that is like our donut hole that we took out. So we could have a delicious snack after we hit our donut. Okay. Now, one thing to keep in mind about this area is that I noticed that both terms have a pi. So like this one has a pi and this one has a pi. So sometimes it's easier if we just write it as pi and then in parentheses, r squared, big R squared minus little r squared. Okay, so I think the second version might be a little bit more useful as we work through the problems, but it comes from exactly that right idea that you just subtract out or you cut out the smaller circle that you don't want. Okay, um, and again, this first picture was just more of a joke that when we say washer method we mean more like this middle picture we don't really mean a washing machine okay all right so let's take a look at some diagrams so if a region in the plane is revolved about a line the resulting solid is a solid of revolution. And the line is called the axis of revolution, okay? So this axis of revolution, I'm gonna be abbreviating that as A-O-R, all right? And so what this is saying is that if we take sort of this piece right here, okay? and I rotate it around the axis, what I'm gonna get is a disc. So the simplest solid that can happen when we revolve this is a right circular cylinder or a disc. And we get this by revolving a rectangle about an axis that is touching one side of the rectangle, okay? So this is the picture that we're gonna be drawing, and then this picture is sort of what we imagine to happen after we revolve it, okay? Now, again, I've included a lot of pictures in our examples for today so that we can take a look at what these things look like. But if you're like, oh man, I just can't see it, I would encourage you to just keep trying, all right? Look these up online. There are plenty of folks out there who have some really fancy technology and have really good um, visuals for helping you see what's happening with your shape. Okay. All right, so let's do an example. Um, so it says, determine the volume of the solid obtained by, here's the key word, rotating the region bounded by x squared equals, or y equals x squared minus, for x plus five and the x-axis. So that's sort of like our bottom function, okay? From one to four about the x-axis. So this kind of wording is very, very common. Um, so we know we're trying to find the volume, okay? And so one of the first things that I do 
when I know that I'm finding the volume is I write down volume equals the integral of area dx or the integral of area dy. All right, I want to remember that that's what I'm trying to do, you know, especially as you're preparing for your final and you're thinking, I don't know, sometimes I need derivatives, sometimes I need integrals, how do I know which one I need? This is a really good way to help you connect that, strengthen that connection in your brain. Okay, so now we're rotating this region bounded by these two graphs. So y equals x squared minus 5x plus 4, we should know is a parabola. Now we're not looking at the whole parabola, we're only looking at a specific slice of it. So I've got this part right here, which is the parabola, okay? Now, <clears throat> they say that this region is bounded by this parabola and the x-axis. So I'm gonna go ahead and highlight that in as my bottom curve, okay? So when I look at this diagram, I already see a top curve and a bottom curve. And in my head, I'm thinking, okay, well, if I wanted to find the area of this, my rectangles would be sort of this way. They would be like, whoa, they would be, perpendicular to the x-axis. These would be vertical lines that we're drawing, but we're stacking these along the x-axis. And so as soon as I see this, I'm already thinking, yeah, I'm gonna use dx and not dy, okay? The other clue for me is that y equals x squared minus 4x plus 5 is not really easy to solve for x, okay? All right, so let's take a look at these three very pretty diagrams that I screenshot from the internet. So when we look at this, okay? The first picture is one that I would expect to see you sketch out on a final exam, okay? And the next few, I wouldn't necessarily expect you to draw, okay? Um, but let's think through this process. So if I take the top picture and I rotate it about the y-axis, what I'm getting is this picture right here, okay? So it kind of looks like a funnel, but at the other, like one end still goes back out, all right? Take a moment and make sure that you can connect these two diagrams in your brain, okay? That when you look at the top one, you can kind of envision where the bottom one came from. Okay. Well, so, I have a question. Why are the edges kind of more rounded once you go to that bottom one versus like the sharp cutoff at one and four? That's a really good question. So what they're trying to show you here is that this is sort of like their way of drawing the 3D part of it. Like when I revolve it, it's not a flat shape. It's a three-dimensional shape. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. So it's kind of like if I ask you to draw a box and you draw something like that, that's two dimension. But if you wanted to draw a three-dimensional box, then you would draw something kind of like that. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Um, but I think by the time we get to sort of like, so this first picture is like a really good example of what I wouldn't expect you to draw. I think some, some folks, I'm always impressed, there are always a few students who are like incredibly artistic and they draw very beautiful diagrams and I'm like, yeah, well, mine's going to look more like this. But, you know, whatever floats your boat, whatever gets you to being able to visualize this is totally fine by me, okay? 
So what happens is, so this first picture is what the shape actually looks like, okay? The second picture is a little bit more stripped away. So you'll notice that they take away sort of that rounded part in the beginning and at the, at the other end. Um, and what they focus on here is this green slice in here, this one right here, okay? Now that slice comes from one, no, it comes from one of those blue lines being rotated around the axis. So every blue line that we draw will give us a different circle in our shape. Okay, so they only drew one circle here, but if I wanted to draw another circle like right here, that one maybe comes from this. Okay, and I have a whole bunch of circles that are stacked together. And when I find the area of each one and then I add them all up together, I get the volume of this shape. Okay. Um, I don't know how many of you out there eat deli meat or have walked by the deli counter in a grocery store, um, but they have like, usually they have like ham and turkey and chicken and it's all like, some of them are round, some of them are square sort of shapes. And then when you ask the deli person, hey, I would like a pound of honey ham, please. Then they take the block of ham and they put it on the slicing machine and then they slice it into really thin pieces of ham. And then they weigh it to see how much, like when you get to your one pound. And so this is kind of similar to that in where we're saying, instead of trying to figure out how much, like the volume of the whole thing, cause that's like a really weird looking shape, what we do is we say every slice is gonna be the same shape. So every slice here is gonna be a circle. And so if we can find the area of each circle and then add them all up together, we should get the whole volume of the shape, okay? Now the two slices that I drew in this middle diagram are only example slices. So really I have an a ton of slices from one to four. I just drew two sort of as, a, as an example, okay? All right, let's take a look at this last picture. So this last picture is much more in line with what I would sort of assume that we are able to sketch, okay? And so for me, what I find really helpful is once I've identified my axis of rotation, so like I know this is my axis of rotation. I take my top picture, like whatever my picture is, right? I draw that part and I only draw it from one to four because they tell me I only care about the region from one to four. And then I draw its reflection underneath because this bottom part, like, how did we know how to draw that? That comes from sort of this part. And it comes from this part, all right? So instead of trying to be too fancy and draw like a really detailed diagram, I kind of cheat it by drawing the actual graph and then I draw its reflection around that axis of revolution. And that helps me visualize in between. Okay. Now in this last diagram, I'm going to go ahead and draw one of my blue lines like I had from my beginning picture. Okay. So this blue line, what does that represent for our slice? radius 
Yeah, it sure does represent the radius, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and on my diagram, I'm gonna make a note for myself that this is the radius of my circle, okay? Now this radius is also defined by the curve that I have. So that means that this will give me the R that I need in my equation, okay? Now, if I drew in like that second circle that I had from before, that line would represent the radius of that other circle. And if I go back to this original diagram, all of these blue hor vertical lines, they represent the radius of every single slice. Okay. So let me zoom back out for a moment, have us kind of look at this. I know it's a lot. All right. And does anyone have any questions before we go ahead and set up our first um, example? So that equation works for each radii, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly, because it'll follow the curve. So it'll take care of the fact that some of them are smaller than others, um, but every single radius is defined by that function. Okay. Okay, so let's go ahead and try setting this up. All right, so we're gonna go back to our volume equals the integral of area dx. And we're going to plug in the information that we have from our problem. Okay, so volume equals the integral of area dx. Okay, now the area formula that I want to use here is going to be pi r squared dx. I am using pi r squared because when I rotate it, every single slice will be a circle. So the word rotate or revolve should be a clue for you, hey, I'm gonna be using circles and I need to have that pi r squared in there. Now they also tell me where to start at one and they tell me where to stop at four. So I can also fill in my bound, okay? Now, when I look at the circles that I have here, is there a hole in the middle of the circle? Okay. Well, it's not a trick question. There are no holes in the middle of the circle, okay? Like when I look in this shape, everything is touching the axis, so it's a solid figure. And that's why I don't need to worry about sort of this middle diagram because I don't have the hole, all right? So that's why I'm able to use this formula, the area equals pi r squared, okay? So let's go back, and we said earlier that the radius is defined by this function. And so instead of r, I'm going to put x squared minus 4x plus 5, okay? All right, so the integral from 1 to 4 of pi times x squared minus 4x plus 5 squared dx, all right? This equation right here would be considered the setup for this question. Okay. 
I'm going to go ahead and factor out the pi. I'm going to bring the pi to the front. And then I'm going to go ahead and foil out this term. Okay. So I've got pi, the integral from 1 to 4 of, let's see, x squared minus 4x plus 5 times x squared minus 4x plus 5 dx. So pi, the integral from 1 to 4 of x to the 4 minus 4x cubed plus 5x squared minus 4x cubed plus 16x squared minus 20x plus 5x squared minus 20x plus 25dx. Okay, well I'm certainly going to look for some like terms to combine before I try and integrate this, okay? So pi, the integral from 1 to 4 of x to the 4th, that's the only one of that one, minus 4x cubed and minus 4x cubed gives me minus 8x cubed. Uh, 5x squared plus 16x squared plus 5x squared. So those are my x squared terms. And that should give me plus 26x squared. And then minus 20 and minus 20 give me a minus 40x plus 25dx. Okay. So definitely a little bit longer because I have to foil out a trinomial, but that's okay. We can take it step by step and just make sure that we've got all of our signs correct. Um, are other people getting this for their integral before we move on? Because we all know sometimes I can't multiply. So let's check ourselves before it gets to two eight. Yep, that's what I got. Okay, thank you. Okay, so from here, the good news is the only rule we need to find our integral is the power rule, okay? So we're going to do the power rule, and then we're going to plug in our 4, and we're going to plug in our 1. So this equals pi, and we're going to get 1 fifth x to the fifth minus 2x to the fourth plus 26 over 3x to the third minus 20x squared plus 25x, and I'm plugging in 4, and I'm plugging in 1. Does that look correct for our antiderivative? So, let's go ahead and plug in our bounds. Um, so when I plug in 4, I've got 4 to the 5th, which is 102, 4 over x, nope, over 5. minus, all right, um, 2 times 4 to the 4, which is 5, 12, plus, 
26 times 4 to the third, and then that's 1664 over 3 minus 20 times 4 squared is 320 plus 25 times 4 is 100. And this is just plugging in the first bound. And so now I have to subtract what happens if I plug in the bottom bound. And the bottom bound will be a little bit more straightforward, though it's not quite as nice as the cases that go to zero. So one fifth minus two plus 26 over three minus 20 plus 25. Okay, let's see what this gets us. I'm going to keep the pi out in front of everything. And I'm going to combine my fifths first. So 1024 minus 1 gives me 1023 over 5. Um, I'm going to combine my thirds next. So 1664 minus a negative, so plus 26, will give me 1690 over three. And now, because I have a bunch of whole numbers, I'm gonna combine the whole numbers. So minus 512, minus 320, plus 100, plus two, plus 20, minus 25. Gives me negative 735. And it looks like I'm going to change everything to a common denominator of 15. So, so 735 times 15 will be 11025. 1690 times 5 is going to be 8450. And 1023 times 3 will give me 3069. And that gives me 494 pi over 15. And let's see if this reduces. And I don't think it does. But I also think we made a mistake somewhere. And by we, I mean me. Let me zoom back out for a moment. Anybody find a mistake? I think after we plugged in the bounds, yeah, for the second half of it, uh -huh. twenty six over three. Does that need to be pos or plus twenty six over three? Ooh, good call. Good call. That is indeed a plus. Okay, so what does that change? That makes that sixteen sixty four minus twenty six which gives me 1638. Okay, let's see if that fixes that. 1638 times five will give me not 8450, but 8190. Okay, this gives me a, not a 494, but a 234. And if I reduce that, I get a 78 pi over 5. And that is the correct answer. So you have found the mistake. Thank you. Okay. What a good problem to get our brains warmed up so early in the morning.
No kidding. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let me just zoom out a little bit so you can kind of take a look at the whole thing. Um, but I'm sure there are questions and I'm sure there's like, oh my gosh, what is happening? But are there any sort of like questions people would like 100% like clarified before we move on to the next example? Or are we ready to try something, try a different one? Um, so how do we know that y, like the equation, like y equals x squared minus 4x plus 5 equals the radius? Okay, so let me zoom back into the first picture, actually, okay? So this first picture right here. This first picture is really where that thinking starts. So if I sort of walk you through what my process would be like if i didn't have these fancy pictures that were already here what i would do is i would go on desmos and i would graph whatever i need to graph so x squared minus 4x plus 5. and when i graph that i would get um a parabola kind of like this yeah and then I would say, okay, but I want to start at one and I want to finish at four. So I have sort of my region. And then I'm like, okay, well, I can't draw this fancy thing. So maybe let me see if I draw the reflection of it, what that looks like. And then I can kind of sketch in like the whole shape. Okay. Now I'm thinking about these lines. And if I take this one line and revolve it around, then I will get the circle. But this line also represents the radius of the circle. So it's not like the base of a rectangle or the diameter of a circle like we saw in, uh, on Tuesday, but it's the radius of the circle. So before I continue explaining, does that part make sense that this line represents the radius? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So then how do I tie that into the equation? Okay. Well, I know that I could find out like this blue line is actually the Y value of the point that is right here. Well, that's supposed to be on the curve, but you know what I mean. So that point has a y value of whatever the x value is. When I plug that in, it will give me the y value. So let's try plugging in a few points, OK? Let's plug in 1 for x. So 1 squared is 1. 1 minus 4 is negative three and negative three plus five is two. This point right here has a coordinate of one comma two. The one represents how far I went side to side, but that two represents how far I went up. And how far I went up is the same as like those blue lines so that's the radius okay that makes more sense okay thank you mm -hmm. okay so let's move on let's try one more example before we go on a break okay and we're going to take a look at example number seven right so example number seven says, determine the volume of the solid obtained by, there it is, rotating the region bounded by y equals the square root of x and the y-axis from zero to three about the y-axis. 
So I know that I have, uh, I have y equals the square root of x as a function. And the other function is this y axis, okay? They tell me where to start and stop. They tell me to start at zero and stop at three. And I'm revolving this shape about the y-axis. And so this like about the y-axis, sometimes on diagrams, you'll see like a little arrow like that, like a curvy arrow. And that arrow is usually there to help you determine where you're rotating your uh, shape, okay? So here's what I'm going to do. I know that you can see all three pictures right now. So take a moment and just kind of think your way through all four pictures. And then I'm going to draw what I would draw if I didn't have this technology so we can kind of connect the dots between what we see someone else do and how we're supposed to approach this problem. Okay, so take a minute to kind of look at how we transform from one like 2D shape into this 3D diagram. Okay, so back in the days when i was learning calculus we didn't have any of this stuff and so i think i think i would have benefited from seeing this stuff but one of the things that i did learn out of this one of the skills i learned is how to uh draw things that may not look as fancy as this first diagram but help me get to the information that i want to be able to see okay so I'm going to draw my version of this right over here to the right. So I set up my x, y axes. Okay. And I know that one of the graphs is y equals the square root of x. And so square root of x I know looks something kind of like that. And I know that it's also bounded by the y-axis. So I'm going to draw that in so I can see sort of like where the whole shape is. And then they tell me that we're going from zero. Whoop. They tell me that we're going from zero to three. OK. Now, one of the things that we have to be really careful about when we read is are these numbers x numbers or y numbers? And so one thing that can tip you off to whether it's an x number or a y number is when they give you the axis of revolution, that's usually telling you where you sort of start and stop, okay? The other way you can kind of tell is if I plug in zero in for x here, I get zero. But if I plug in three, I don't get a nice number. And so it's not that everything is with like nice numbers, but believe it or not, we do kind of try and keep them so that they're not like too many random decimals and fractions, okay? And so by those two clues, I can tell that zero and three are y values. So I'm going to mark off 0 on the y-axis, and I'm going to mark off 3 on the y-axis, OK? Now I'm going to go ahead and let me mark it a little bit lower. If I extend this line, OK, they, the green line and the blue line will intersect. And it's probably a good idea to write out that coordinate. So if I know that the y value is 3, I know that the x value is 9 at that point. OK? Now, let's draw 
the reflection of this. Okay, now because I'm rotating around the y axis, I don't want to draw my shape down here. Okay, because that's not revolving around the y axis. What I want to do is imagine what it would look like if I revolved it around that axis. And so my reflection should be around the y axis. Okay. And so when I look at this and I'm imagining that every slice in here, I'm seeing that slices are going this way. Okay, so sort of up the y axis. And each one of those lines that I drew represents the radius of the circle that I get when I revolve that line around the y axis. Okay, so each one of these blue lines is a radius. Now, if I were to imagine the blue lines on the other side of the axis, like the re reflection, I would maybe have like that and like that and like that, okay? Do the dark blue lines and the light blue lines touch? Yes. Yeah, they do. Okay. So I know that seems like sort of a random question because you just saw me draw, draw them and clearly they, they met at the orange line. But when they meet, that means that I don't have a hole. So I don't have like a regular looking donut slice. I have like a filled donut slice. So it's like a jelly donut. You know, it's got no hole in the middle or it's like that circle, it's just a circle, there's no hole in the middle. So that's another clue to help you figure out like, does it have a hole or does it not have a hole, okay? Um, now I know that what I drew is two dimensional, but let's kind of go back to what these fancy diagrams from the interweb had, which are similar to what I have, but definitely have more detail, okay? So if we look at this first diagram, you can tell that the shape is like a funnel, okay? And this pink circle at the top, all right, this pink circle at the top is meant to help you see sort of the topmost cross section, that the topmost cross section is a circle. And if I even draw in my line right there, I get the radius, okay? Now, the next diagram is sort of the same thing, but stripped away. They took, they sort of cut it down the front so that you can only really see sort of the back half, all right? And they give you one circle that's down here to see the whole circle, all right? So that's one slice. But what that tells me is on my original diagram, yeah, I could draw these lines and they're horizontal, but they're perpendicular to my axis of revolution. And every one of those lines corresponds to another circle that I could draw in my diagram. So like I could put a little baby circle down here. I could put another circle down here. I could put another circle in here. And all of these circles are being stacked up the Y axis. As soon as I've said that, I'm thinking, okay, volume equals the integral of area dy because I'm stacking things up the Y axis, okay? And then this last diagram is maybe the most stripped away. There's not really any colors to it, right? We're just saying, okay, I can imagine what one of the slices looks like. So now um, the question is this. Let's imagine that I asked just for this very top slice here, okay? So at the very top of this funnel, you have a circle. What is the radius of that circle? Uh, 
nine. How did you know that? You were right. The x axis. Yeah, because you're counting. Okay, so the radius is like this far. That's really good. Um, what if I asked you folks about a circle that was right at y equals 2? What's the radius of that circle? Square root x. What's the number, though? Like, how big is that? Like three, three and a half. Four. Maybe four. Yeah. Mm, okay. So I know that up here at three, at a y value of three, the radius was nine. If I have a y value of two, what's the x value that goes with it? Four. Four, okay. So we can go back to this equation to help us figure that out, okay? What if I have a circle slice at an x, uh, sorry, a y value of one? What is the radius of that circle? One. One, okay. So I know that the square root of one is one. So one pattern that I want to point out to you guys is that in this case, sorry, I'm trying to think about where to write this. Um, in this case, the radius equals the x value of y equals the square root of x. So as long as we know the y value, we can find the x value and go with that. Okay. Now, what that means is that I don't want the equation to be y equals, I want the equation to be x equals, okay? So if I take this equation and I square both sides, I will get y squared equals x, okay? Now, if the x value is the radius, what that also means is y squared is the radius. And let's go back and just check that with the numbers we had from our diagram here. So when I told you there was a circle at y equals 3, if I square 3, I get 9, and that was the radius you guys told me correctly, that circle had. And then we checked when the y value was 2, and you guys told me that the radius is 4. Well, 2 squared is 4. And the last one, I told you the y value was 1, and you guys correctly identified that the radius is 1, but 1 squared is 1. Okay? What if I asked you about a circle at a y value that maybe wasn't so nice. Like, let's say you have a slice, a circle at y equals 1.5. What is the radius of that circle?
All right, let me ask that question one more time. If I have a y value of 1.5, what is the radius of the circle at that y value? Two point two five. Two point two five, and how did you put that? Since uh, y squared is equal to the radius. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we take one point five and we square it, and we get two point two five. Okay. So if I said, "Hey, you've got a circle at a y value of two point five," then you could say two point five squared would be six point two five, and that would give you the radius of the circle at y equals two point five. Okay. So our equation for the radius is right here that y squared, okay? So because we know that we're rotating, we know we're gonna get slices that are circle. And so everywhere I see this a for area, I can put pi r squared. Now I don't need the big r squared minus the little r squared because from my diagrams, I can see that there's no hole in the middle, okay? So we can say that volume equals the integral from zero to three, okay? Because we've got those bounds from our problem from zero to three of pi times radius squared. So this is my radius. And so really I have my pi radius squared, okay? Now this one I think will be a much nicer integral than the one we saw in the first problem today, okay? I'm gonna go ahead and bring the pi out to the front the integral from zero to three of y to the four dy. And I'm gonna integrate, so pi times one fifth y to the fifth. And I'm gonna plug in three and I'm gonna plug in zero. And I'm gonna get pi one fifth three to the fifth is gonna be 243. So let's actually write this as 243 over five minus zero over five. And so that will give me a final answer of 243 pi over five. Okay. All right. So I think this is a good place to stop for a moment, take a break, see how we feel in a little bit. All right. But when we come back, um, we're going to go through as many more examples as we can. There are a lot of examples in here. Um, and whatever we don't finish today, we'll go ahead and bump to Tuesday of next week. All right. Um, I know this is a challenging topic. And so I think it's worth taking the time rather than rushing through it to make sure that we really understand where all these numbers come from and how to draw the pictures. And so let's see, it is 1045 right now. So let's take a break until 1055 and then we'll come on back and work through as many equations as we can, all right? So be back here at 10.55.